Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Friday webinar. Welcome, Lisa. We've got Lisa Bono with us today. Uh, we're uh, back with you for the first of 2023, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. see you since 2022. Um, so we have a very special episode of The Gray Way. We're going to be talking about behavior, why understanding instinct is key. So any behavior topics, uh, those, are, those are definitely um, fun to join in on because, I mean, parrots... Behavior. Parrot behavior is just so outside the box different than your typical cat or dog behavior. <laughs> so many. Right. Anyways, that's right. So um, let's see. While we wait for people to log in, Lisa, um, you got your your gray crew behind you there. You want to yeah. want to remind it who, who's who on which perch? So we, uh, I see four. Four. Right? Um, it looks like right behind me, this one's Sydney. Sydney. There we go. Then over here is Emma. Then closer one is Sam. Abby is right next to me. You can't really see her. She gets very excited. Let me see her. She, there she, is. <laughs> uh, she gets very excited with the computer. So I try to keep her a little bit off view. Um, and then Sterling is all the way in the back there behind Sam. Um, I have him back there because I was doing a webinar and he flew and landed on my head. And then the webinar I did on Wednesday, Sydney decided to travel over to Emma's tree behind my back. And while they're okay with that, he was actually trying to get to Abby because she was on Emma's tree too. I just couldn't see it all. So they were doing shenanigans. <laughs> yes. yes. I just so imagine as... I'm imagining a seat, sitting in a classroom, like who's front and center, who wants to be towards the side. It's kind of a little bit... Uh, instinct on their maybe other their uh typical personalities there <laughs> right there we go so that that's why i'm trying to figure who goes where and usually sydney's a screamer he's the one you hear in the background um so i wanted him closer so this way if i have to pick him up i can pick him up quiet him well, down I, i'm sure vocalizations will be part of our topic today yes <laughs> all yes, right it will. <laughs> Uh, so Lisa, I believe you have a fabulous uh, PowerPoint for us. So you always have these really good PowerPoints that make it super easy to follow along and, and get it embrained on your, the information embrained on your brain. So um, do you want to go ahead and, because I'm sure I am going to guess we're going to get a, a good um, slew of questions today for you at the end. Yes. So just a reminder to everybody that if you do have a question uh, for Lisa, to um, use the Q and A button, and we'll try to get to those um, towards the end of the webinar. So I um, hopefully left a little time at the end uh, for people with the questions and what they're observing in their own birds, um, what they might think is you know instinctual or if it's a learned behavior. So I'm going to touch on a couple different, more of the easier things to notice in your own flock, um, and let you know why the bird's actually doing what it's doing and not being a bad bird. All right. Well, then let's take it away. Right. Let's get started. Let's dive in. Yeah. All right. Here we go. OK, sorry. I just got to move a couple things around so I could actually see. OK, I want to thank everybody for joining us in 2023. Um, I thought this would be a great topic because I do a lot of consults with people um, and I hear that the bird is, according to them, not behaving or being bad. And we try to go over and, and let people understand the difference between a so-called bad behavior um, and why they're doing it and how to adapt it and how to work with it and live with it. So let's start. Behavior is an action, activity, or process which can be observed and measured. Often these actions, activities, and processes are initiated in response to stimuli, which are either internal or external. Now, I did write some of this out. This way, people can actually take pictures of it or take their notes so, you know, they can refer to them later on so they could try to figure out, you know, what is going on. And that's Sydney right there in his little timeout chair. So to understand behavior, we need to know what it is. The, this is the way in which someone conducts itself or behaves. 
the manner of conducting oneself. And this comes from Webster, uh, William Webster, Miriam Webster, yeah, I can't really see it down there in the corner. Um, anything that an organism does involving action and response to stimulation, response of an individual group or species to its environment, and this is the most important one, the way in which something functions or operates. As you all know, these birds function a lot differently than we do. So why is understanding instinct the key? Because it's a way in which something op functions or operates. So the terms hardwired, which I use a lot, instinctive or innate, describes behaviors that are, are not learned, behaviors you already know how to do for the first time. Penny calling. All right. Hopefully he didn't mess up the slide here. He just flew over and landed on me. Um, Instinctive behaviors are important for promoting the survival of your species. Instinct, by definition, is hardwired behavior. It is, does not have to be learned. It's passed on from generation to generation. Therefore, naturally, it's a result of instinct rather than being thought about, planned, or developed by any training. For instance, Sterling flying over to me about the computer. I have to put him back on his stand. Excuse me one second. Start reading that. You can't do that. Here. Go in here. You become part. He's not, he's not going to stay on his tree today. So an instinctive behavior is an action or in an organism. It's performed by every member of their species. These behaviors are hardwired and present from birth. That is Sydney there in that little picture when I got him. Um, it's migration, nest building, and raising a family are instinctive behaviors. Babies are not taught this, but already know how to do it. The learned behavior is taught starting in the nest. It's something that an animal discovers to be beneficial through observation, trial, and error. Learned behavior can adapt over time to suit changing conditions. That's what happens in our homes. An example of a parrot playing with a foraging toy is a learned behavior. So here we have Emma, this little stinker. Um, I put something in her little treat dish right there because I wanted to show you guys a video of Emma actually learning how to forage. It's a very um, easy foraging dish we have here. And you can see she's watching me more than anything else. So let's play it again. That's as simple as it possibly can get. And to let you know, as soon as I stopped that, she lifted that little lid, got her head right in there before I can even start the camera again. So, now we're gonna get into some things that your birds are going to be doing in your homes, okay? A lot of times people will contact me and say, my bird's screaming and you know, it's, it's carrying on. I, I don't know what's going on. I call that vocalizing. So is, this, is a scream, a scream, a scream? Is there a difference? So you have your natural noises. Um, that we hear every day from these birds. Now, these are things you'd hear in the wild that's not gonna change coming into our home. And this is not a beha bad behavior. This is normal behavior for a parrot. You have your morning greetings. Um, it might be when the sun's coming up. It might be when they hear you starting to move around. And what they're doing is they're calling out to their flock, as they would do in the wild, to make sure that everybody survived through the night. Nobody died. Nobody got eaten by a snake. Everybody's fine. So it's a morning greeting. How you doing? Completely normal. You have your daily chatter all day long. Like you'll hear Sterling behind me because he's going to be trying to get my attention. They don't just sit there, they chatter, especially the little parakeets all day long. The bigger guys tend to go through times where they will you know, be noisy for a half hour and then be lazy and maybe take a nap and you know, then decide to wake everybody up and start again. But 
Paul Norma. Happy to be alive outburst. So sometimes we all get happy and we just want to, you know, jump for joy and clap and be happy. Well, same thing with them. They're just happy to be alive and let's scream. There might be a bird outside your window, you know, that they're trying to talk with or, you know, get the attention, but it's normal behavior. Contact calls. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I leave the room and my bird is screaming and carrying on. That's what they would do in the wild. The bird that's left alone in the wild is usually someone else's dinner. So, you know, they want to be around their flock. They're going to call you. So I make contact, contact calls back with my guys. It doesn't happen so much with a flock as as much as a single parrot. So you wanna make sure you have some kind of contact ball. You don't leave them in a room or put them away somewhere and expect them to be quiet because that's not gonna happen. So if he calls out to you, um, you may wanna call back and make sure that it is something that you wanna hear for the next 60 years. So, you know, you might wanna call back and say, how you doing or hello, or try to morph that noise into something that's a little bit more acceptable, but a contact call is happening in the wild. Then you have your evening greetings as well. A lot of you come home from work and your birds start screaming and carrying on and maybe you're not in the mood. Well, you are the only thing that bird has and the bird's been sitting there all day entertaining itself while you're away. So I always tell people um, when they come home that one of the things they wanna do is greet their bird. You would greet the dog if it came running to you. You would greet your husband or your kids. Why not greet the bird? So that is completely normal. And then again, at night in the wild, what they would be doing and they'd be calling all their, their flocking, you know, hey, Fred, hey, Sam, come on, it's time to go to bed. Nobody, you know, nobody got hurt during the day. No, no lions ate them. They're everybody's, you know, fine and safe. And so come on home, it's time to go to bed. And so that is part of that bedtime chatter as well. So some of them, some people even report to me that after the bird is covered, they'll get in there and they'll, you know, they'll chatter real quiet. They'll go over all the words they know. Um, that's all normal. And you shouldn't be trying to really change those behaviors. You have to learn to live with it, work with it and see what you can change as, as far as if you have some obnoxious scream, which everybody's heard that. Um, so yeah, you want to, you want to work with it, but know that they're not going to be quiet. So if your bird is screaming, that's Sterling. He's overexcited in that picture, as you can tell. Um, when your bird is screaming, you want to try to figure out what is going on. If it's, if it's a noise that is loud, um, and he seems a little bit off or different or different is, is it an alarm call? check and see if something scared your bird. And you wanna make sure that if your birds are in front of the windows, you have a place that they can retreat to and get away from perceived danger. So if you have them in full windows like I do, um, there's nothing really that can spook them unless you know it's a bird flying by or it happens to be my husband on the golf cart in the backyard. Um, that's what my guys will warn me with. So. Abby's very good with letting me know about there's a squirrel in the backyard and my husband's wandering around on the golf cart in the backyard doing yard work. Another thing to check for with that scream, if it sounds off or it sounds different, is your bird hurt? You know, he might, might be screaming in pain or he might be trying to get your attention because he's hurt. Um, you always want to make sure, and I tell you this all the time, make sure your veterinarian's number is easily available. Um, and like with Sterling in this picture, is your bird overexcited? The, with Amazons, the louder and more exciting the surroundings are, the louder the bird becomes. So it's like um, when I had my Amazons, you know, it was like, a, especially my double yellow, if, you know, if you had your music loud, he was louder. If you had guests over, he was louder. He enjoyed doing that. That's probably something they all do in the wild. My guys become a little, the grays become a little bit more quiet and observing when you have a lot of people. Um, but if you if your bird is overexcited and carrying on for some reason, make sure you take a deep breath before you walk in, lower your energy level and talk calmly or even whisper to them. 
When receiving the desired response, when the bird calms down, always remember to reward it with positive reinforcement. I know a lot of people do treats. I do good girl or good boy, and it'll go a long way. Sydney's been reminding me a lot lately that he's a very good boy. So living with parrot noise, how do you achieve a harmonious household with a loud parrot? It's important when you're looking for your parrot that you want to decide what species you're going to go and do your homework. If you have a cockatoo or a macaw that can, you know, that are designed to be heard for miles through the jungles and wherever they're at, um, or the plains, you want to make sure that you're not bringing that type of bird, no matter how cute or cuddly they may be, into your townhome, because that's not going to work. Um, you know, if, if you have a more quiet bird, um, you know, the parakeets, again, they chatter all day long. So living with a larger bird now, parakeet would probably be music to my ears hearing that or a canary all day long. But if you're in a condo or an apartment, your neighbor might be complaining about a noise they hear all the time. So you have to be careful with what you choose so the bird stays in your house and you don't have a problem. Normally, they say that African greys are typically a little bit quieter than most species. Um, you can hear my guys in the background. Every once in a while, they really start going, but it's not nearly as much as some of the other species that, that have lived with me. So parrots will often learn to produce loud vocalizations to, re to receive desired responses that they want. So if you're in another room and the bird is screaming, 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 and you're rushed and you're aggravated and maybe you're arguing with somebody else and you walk in there and you yell at the bird. Well, the bird's not listening to your words. It's thinking, okay, my yelling made human come. That's what I wanted. That was my reinforcement right there, that person coming into my room. So that's where the contact calls come into play. OK, a bird is going to scream more if it's if it's isolated. These guys aren't meant to be isolated and left in a room all day long. And then you decide to go play with them and go in the room or whatever. Um, they're they're They are flock animals. They want to be with you. So if you have a setup like that, make sure that your bird's able to come out a lot, that he's safe. If you have other animals, maybe instead of having that bird in that room all the time, maybe you want to find a spot where your dog can go for a little bit so the bird can come have come out, have a change of scenery, see what's going on. You know, to, to stop the screaming, you have to work with you. You can't just expect the bird to stop when you go in there and say, shut up, because it's going to happen again. The sound level you consider appropriate and ideal will be dictated by the species and what you're willing to live with. Now, like I said, with the, I've had a lot of cockatiels, a lot of parakeets. I've had birds 40 something years. Um, all my guys have lived out their lives with me, which is, is very good. And so they were always smaller birds until I got into the bigger guys. I did live with a couple cockatoos. Honestly, the dust and dander from their feathers was just way too much for an asthmatic, even though I lived with, I think, 17 cockatiels at one point, and I now have five African greys. They didn't bother me as bad as being around one cockatoo. So usually when these cockatoos came into my house, um, I always was in a single standing home, so it was no part problem with that, but usually they would be in my homes for a couple days, they would carry on normal screams, the rest of my guys would get really quiet not knowing what's going on, and then I ended up finding very good homes for these guys and realized that I couldn't physically take a cockatoo in to work with it. So know what you're getting into before you go out and buy or adopt. It's a great idea to volunteer at a rescue. First off, they would probably love to have you there. And you can get to know the different species and the noises that come out and see what you can live with it before you just run willy-nilly to the pet store and buy one.
You cannot train your parrots to be quiet, nor should you expect them to be. Parrots are vocal by nature, and we need to understand and accept the vocalizations as part of parrot ownership. So biting, this is another issue I hear about a lot. My bird's biting me and, you know, I don't know what to do. Or is it really reaching for something versus biting? So we're going to talk about when you offer your hand to your bird and it reaches out with its beak, all right? You pull your hand back. What has this, your action, taught the bird to do next time? Let's see what you say in the chat. What do you think is going to happen with, okay, I'm checking out the chat here. Okay. Good, Adrian. Faster, harder, faster, harder. Good. Hold tighter. I don't want to say that too many times. Hold tighter. Bite makes hand go away. Okay. All great <laughs> and all correct. So it's going to teach the bird that it wants to get up on your hand. It grabs with its beak, you get scared, you pull it back. The bird is gonna think, all right, well, next time that hand comes near me, in order for me to be able to get on, I'm gonna have to grab quicker and hold on. And then you're gonna perceive it as a bite. But was it? Was a bird just trying to reach for your hand because it was too far for it to, too far away for it to step up on? Was your hand too high? As you can see my hand uh, with Sammy there, and that camera is awful good because my hand looks horrible. Um, is, you know, is she, what's she trying to do? Is she trying to stabilize me? Is she trying to push my hand down? You know, they can't lift a foot all the way up to their, their beak to get up. And they're not going to step down from a perch. They want to step up onto something. So, you know, that you have to think about all this stuff as, as you're working with your bird and trying to get them up. And each time you go to give them your hand, not just once. Every time you try to figure out how you're going to offer your hands, make sure it's steady and watch the bird. While, you know, like Abby, I know that she gets a little excited and she gets a little feisty. So she may need to step up on one of the um, sticks or a towel. That's an option for her as well. But you, you have to watch their eyes and make sure you know if they look like they're you know watching your hand and they want to step up they're probably just trying to steady the object. So let's ask why, and again, in the chat, I wanna say, well, you, Sydney, why is the bird reaching with its beak to step up? So I'm looking in. Okay, won't trust stability, okay. Balance. Couple more, I'm still waiting to see what I'm thinking. Why is the bird reaching with its beak to step up? Okay, third foot, make sure it's stable, okay. All right, so my thought here was the bird is reaching with its beak to step up because it doesn't have hands. So it needs something to be able to reach out with and it's going to be its beak. So here we have Emma. She was, she was being a good little model for me. Um, here she is stepping up. Drake, step up. Come on. Is it moving? Good girl. Okay. For some reason, it didn't move for me. Drake, step up. Here we go. Come on. Good girl. Okay. So in the beginning, I want you to watch her mouth. Drake, step up. Come on. People would perceive that as a bite oh. and pull away. Drake, step but up. But if you watch her Come eyes, on. she's watching me. Her foot goes up. Good girl. And she didn't know she had to steady my hand or not. But that was completely normal. Now, here we have Sydney. This is showing you a little bit more. Um, so-called what people would say aggression. Sydney has white coat syndrome, so he doesn't really like towels. Um, and it was the best way to show you guys uh, a little bit to watch with the aggression. And why I might not offer him my hand. 
Sydney. Would you like to step up? Okay, so you can see he's really chewing on there. Watch it again. I asked him once to step up, Sydney. that's what I got. Now Is watch step up? watch his bite. See? So he's some someone that I necessarily wouldn't stick my hand there and expect him to get up. Not at that moment, because it's probably a little bit feisty. So it doesn't mean that I got to sit there and persist because he is able to make up his own mind unless there was a fire or this, you know, a something that was a, a, he had to listen to me right then and there, which this was not that situation. He's got his choice. He, he can sit there for a little while longer. I'll go back and I'll try again. And I use my hand and he got right up. That was an example I wanted to show you. So here we have Abby. And she's doing decent um, for everybody who's following. Um, she was watching me and we were doing all these videos. She is not a fan of electronics. I don't know if it's something that, you know, if it gives off something, you know, waves or whatever, but she was not happy with the phone being around. So I could see in her eyes, she really wasn't going to behave if I offered her my hand. Uh, she would probably reach with her beak and reach and bite hard. So we did her little perch. Abigail, would you like to step up? Come on, up, up. Oh, what a good girl. Yeah, good girl. So I gave her, I gave her a kiss from afar because I knew she was still going to be feisty. And she, the... Reward she got Abigail. was good girl. Would you like to step up? Come on, up, up. I was oh, kind of hoping girl. that she would yeah. go with her beak to show good you, girl. but she she was, I think, with her being sick, our relationship is really blossoming because she's much calmer um, Abigail. and working with me. So this was Abby a few years back, and I guess this is what people expect birds to do when they're stepping up on something. Now I had my hand far back for this picture. Uh, she was reaching out. Birds don't step up like that. They don't usually just stick their foot out as far as they go. They do little short steps and they're gonna use your hand to stabilize. So keep that in mind. Now chewing. All hook bills in the wild, do this. It helps to maintain the beak shape, beak health, and mental stimulation. They don't know the difference between your, your Victorian vanity or, or Queen Anne couch. They don't care either. It's wood, and they're going to get to whatever they can to do this natural instinct. So here's Abby, and I took a lot of time to make all matching covers at night. And so their little room looks good. And she decided she was going to remodel it and give herself a view so she can watch everybody in the hallway as they're walking past. So I can't be angry with her for this. She could reach it. She's going to chew it. And she seems pretty content with the little size of that hole. Now, if you have a bird that's going to do this, I want you constantly to check all those strings to make sure there's nothing she can get, they can get stuck in. Um, I did have to cut a couple of little strings off um, to make it easier for her to see past them, but it, she's going to chew. So this is, this is Jake. He's not a fan of the bathrobe that he's on, so he's a little bit excited. And you can see that he got a hold of the woodwork down by the bottom. Uh, he's chewing on his little wood toy that, or the, the little cardboard that was acceptable, was given to him to chew, but he's going to test other things. So because your bird is chewing on the wall or chewing wherever, does not make it a bad bird. Here's Sophia. She loves it when daddy spends money on her. So this is no exception. Uh, she got a hold of some money the other day and he had to show it with us. And this is typical. It was in beak reach. And this is, I believe, from a cockatoo from um, East, which is a sanctuary in Tennessee. And I asked for some pictures and the bird did what it would do in the wild. It was having fun. It doesn't understand it's doing anything wrong. So how do we prevent destruction? 
even the best caregivers will find themselves with something the bird's been destroyed, okay? Um, it may be a chair, windowsill, or carpet, but you can't blame the bird that's left within beak reach. Now, these two pictures you see here are in my bird room. They really don't care, you know, how much we spent for this room to add on. It's good for them. And I was actually surprised that both of these are from Sammy. Now, she won't necessarily chew on much wood, but she found the windowsill very tempting. So I had to fill it in with just some white paint. And someday it'll be fixed right. But I had to make sure that she can't reach it. So what I would do is when we first built the room, put everybody in here, you know, she had this whole side of the room where she can come out any, pretty much any time I was home and she can go to her tree and she can sit on top of her cage and do whatever she wanted. And I tried to make it like that with all the birds. But a lot of the boys were trying to get on the girls' cages because they're interested in something else. And one day I couldn't see Sam on top of her cage or her, her play gym. And it was because she was down between the cage and the windowsill chewing on my windowsill. Can't blame her. It's natural. So it doesn't make them a bad bird. So that's Sterling with all his toys. So now we're going to talk about what we can do to try to prevent that. If you're letting a bird down on the floor, it has access to all kinds of things. You can expect lots of chewing to go on. You want to try to offer as many toys as you want. And that was the background with Sterling. We were waiting for part of his cage to come in because it came in bent. So he was not living in that cage and I needed to get these big toys up out of the way. So I just hung them in there. They were not all his, but we want to make sure we have a variety of things that they can chew on to keep them occupied for mental stimulation, you know, to keep their beak in shape and keep them occupied. And this is a lot of people will say that, well, my bird doesn't like toys or to destroy them too quickly. Well, yeah, that's kind of what they do. If a destroyed toy is an enjoyed toy. So this is what's left um, between Sammy's Valentine's Day stuff and her Christmas stuff. One day she just decided to go after everything. And that was a good day for her. She was busy. She was happy. And she got new toys. So here's Zippy checking out his toy box. This is a toy box I sent out for Valentine's Day. And, you know, Notice, even though he's got all these great toys in there to choose from and pick, what's he doing? He's still chewing on the box. So that's that's typical. They're testing everything. It's in his beak reach, and that's what he's going to do. Uh, another thing is birds being cautious. Um, my, people will say, my bird's afraid of this, or it's scared of that. Um, all birds pretty much are being being afraid or saying it's scared is 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 a word that we would describe how we feel as humans in the bird world being cautious saves lives and ensures the species will continue for generations to come for any prey animal which a bird is going to be this is a must if they're not watching their environment if they're not cautious of things that are coming in they may not live for the next couple minutes. So, you know, if, if especially if it's a bird that is solitary um, in our home, it's going to be more scared than, than, say, in a flock. Usually if in my own flock, if something's going on, Abby is the big mouth. She will alarm us of that golf cart in the backyard uh, or the squirrel. Um, a lot of times when she's going on, if she's carrying on, I tell her there better be an elephant. If I have to get in there and look, there better be an elephant in that backyard. So this is what they do. So if you have a bird, if you have, if you have a gray that 18 to, to 24 months is really the time when it's important for them to start getting used to things. Don't put your bird in the back room, think you have a great bird room, and that's it. Um, you wanna make sure the bird comes out. You maybe wanna walk it around, let it see everything, let it get used to the environment. No two birds are really afraid of the same thing. And no one else could care if there's a squirrel outside except for Abby. 
Um, I had one gray that passed away very early. He was afraid of milk jugs and boxes. So, you know, you see people's birds playing with boxes. Mine was terrified. Um, and yeah, I mean, when would he see a milk jug, you know, other than it being in, in the kitchen? So all those things sent him in into a panic and we had to kind of guide him past that little stage. So this is normal for a bird to act like that. So here are two pictures of Emma. And you can see on the left side of the screen, that's her normal stand. She's a little puffy. She's relaxed. Her eyes, you know, relaxed. Um, look at her toes. Her toes aren't even really holding on to her perch. The next picture, she was spooked by something. So see how she flattened down a little bit? All her feathers are pulled in tight. Her eye is round. And look, her toenails are holding on. So you, you're able to see with how they hold their body and the body language, if the bird is nervous about something and you might have to explain to them what's going on or calm them down, just don't ignore it because they don't know. So this picture is here to remind me of a story um, versus giving them boxes um, to play in. Uh, I have a friend that unfortunately we weren't able to get pictures of his bird, but. His, his, his setup was you would come in the front door and you'd walk through the living room and then to the right hand side. That's it was like a little alcove. That's where the dining area would be. And he put his bird cages in there. So the birds were pretty much um, they were able to see around and what was going on. But if you came in the front door and you walked a little bit, all of a sudden you appeared in their area. So he had a baby gray that was just a little freaked out by things just appearing. So if you're carrying in groceries or anything like that, the bird would freak out. So they had to come up with a solution because that was the main door to come in. And he's not just going to say no one's allowed to my house. Um, so what, what he ended up doing is if he came in, he would start saying before he, birds could even visually see him um, coming through coming through. So this way the bird knew what to expect. And eventually what ended up happening is he, the bird would hear the front door open, maybe hear another voice or maybe hear a bag ruffling or something. And as he's walking towards where the birds were, this one bird learned to say coming through. So it calmed itself down because he knew it was safe because that's what he was taught. So now we have some chicken scratching. And a lot of people will say, oh, what, what's going on? Does he want out of the cage? Is, is, he, is, you know, is he afraid? What, what's he trying to do? Well, we really don't know the reason for it, but all grays do it. Every single one of them from babies up to you know, my 40 year old will do it. Um, we're not exactly sure what the purpose is. I don't really know if cockatoos or macaws or anything do because I haven't heard anybody say that. I know my cocktails did not, but every single one of my grays do. So here we have Maggie and Cinder. Look at Maggie's tail and her wings. Woohoo! So she's probably. After she was done scratching, she was probably going to look to see what was available within Beak Reach. <laughs> um, but that that's that was Maggie. Um, they all do this. It's not a bad behavior. It's normal for them to do it. So here we have Pepper. Oh my God. It's so cool. Pepper does it a little bit longer. You can see he's on a different material, so it doesn't have to be on the floor. Now, I want you to notice something between Pepper and Maggie that we just watched. Look, you got, you got so exhausted fever. there, he almost fell over. Anyway, you can't get under the pillow. I'm going to ask silly. you again in the chat. See if you can notice something between Pepper, and we're going to go back, and Maggie. One's a Timna, one's a Congo. Oh my God, it's so cool. Oh my God. 
Rusty over there is just watching. He wasn't having any any part of this chicken scratching stuff. Okay. So let me go down to the chat. Oh, your your white belly kayak chat also <laughs> scratches. Interesting. Mine does not. Um, so let's see. Huh. Did you guys notice anything similar with the two grays? They both had their heads down while they were scratching. Mm. Not. <laughs> nope. Okay. So think about it as we go on, and I'll show you what I caught. Now, why do we call it chicken scratching? I don't know if this is playing correctly. There we go. Okay, they get in there and they do it with both feet and they're looking for bugs. So I'm pretty sure they'll do this in the nest. Um, they're looking for bugs. You know, the, the grays will do the same thing. So now think back to the two that I asked you to look at and watch Tweed. Again, it doesn't matter what substrate is there. Huh. So we have people saying for foraging or for. Well, they do it. Yes, they'll do it for foraging. The parents will do it while they're building a nest. They'll do it while chicks are in the nest. They're cleaning out the nest. Um, so this is this is done by instinct. I mean, I don't think anybody taught these guys how to do this. It's just something they know. So whether you know, I, I can't say that it's I can't say <laughs> Someone... it's purely nesting. Someone because commented that it's it. one foot too, that they're doing just with one foot, the same foot. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so Tweed is actually kicking with his left foot. That's the first time I've seen that because most grays will kick with the other foot. So I think, thought that- Do you think he's a lefty then by nature? <laughs> well, I think a lot of grays are left footed. I'm not exactly sure, but it's it's I thought it was interesting and, and observable that you know he did it with the, the the left foot versus the other one. So another thing that um is 100 percent normal that people ask me about and question is nesting and wanting a family. Uh, females do not need a male. To have an egg. A lot of people are under the impression you have to have two in the house to have an egg. That's not so. A lot of people that are watching probably had a mysterious egg show up and that is just, it's its in there. It's normal. It's natural. Um, you know, all us ladies, the majority of ladies want to have a family um, and it doesn't really matter. That's just in us. So this is Emma's best attempt to make a little nest. She got behind my pillow. This is Abby. She likes to take wood and put it inside her food dish because she can just about get in there. So I'll hear her in there actually chicken scratching halfway in the bowl, trying to get in there. So I, I believe that is her attempt of making a nest. So it's going to be normal, especially if you're letting your bird down on the ground and you're letting them walk, walk around, that they're going to look for things to get under, things to get in, or things to get behind. That's another good reason I don't let my guys on the floor. I know a lot of people give boxes um, to the birds as well. And while they really enjoy having the box to get into, and yes, it makes a cute picture, no, that's also nesting. It's encouraging nesting. So, all right, maybe it's not that awful if you have a boy that might be nesting or trying to. Um, there are repercussions for him doing that. You could have um, medical issues arise. But the female, if she's allowed to get in there and make a nest, you're going to see that she's going to get a little feisty because it is normal in the wild for them to protect their nest 
So don't be surprised if she charges you or bites you and means to bite you because you're infringing on her um, her territory and her, her baby nesting. So instead of giving them a box that they can get into to simulate nesting, I always tell people to cut the cardboard up into little, you know, little squares and maybe put it on a skewer. They make stainless steel skewers. You can put that on there. The bird's going to have just as much fun tearing it, and you're not engaging that natural behavior of wanting to have babies and reproducing. So if you want to find out a little bit more about your species, this is an excellent uh, place to look. This is Parrots of the World. And I understand there's, um, I don't know if there's more than one uh, volume. There very well may be. I do have this mm. volume. It's still packed that I can't find from a move down here. But uh, I understand it hits just about every species. And it'll tell you a little bit more of what is normal in the wild and what you can expect in your home. And it'll help you meet your parrot's physical and emotional needs properly. So this is the end of the webinar, and I'm interested to have others tell me behaviors mm -hmm. that they observe to see if it's instinctual or learned. So let me stop share. You stop. <laughs> I'm sitting these close to me. You come over. Oh, here. This, well, <sighs> they just want to participate in the behavior. Uh, exactly. Behavior. <laughs> so exactly. we're, waiting for, we're waiting for i'm sure we've we got some questions let's see what's uh so so lisa going back to um when you're when you're talking about how th they use their beak to like as a third foot to get, you know i know like cockatiels and budgies they they just i've never had one that's used like their their beak to do that i wonder if have you, have you noticed that it's they do you have I, you had I, one that used their beak yes yeah, yeah I, i've had two cockatiels that were special able um, and they would use their beak every single time they got up on me. Uh, they one had bad toes, one didn't have any bones in his toes, which was really weird. Um, and the other one rested on um, her legs versus her feet because her legs were twisted. And they would every single time. Okay, that's interesting. I was just uh, because I, I mean they're I just wondering if they lead with their beak as much as the larger parrots as far as. And stuff goes. I think people are just a little bit more afraid of a larger bird with its beak coming at you. But know that know the little guys, so they they hurt. <laughs> they pinch. They pinch, hurt. pinch. <laughs> I, 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 I do some grooming on a parakeet, and he's got a really nice pinch bite going on. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got a, a question from Kelly. Wants to know how do we get our Timna not to bully our Congos? So he can't. He can fly, and they can't. So. Um, uh they had injuries before coming to 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 their household so um okay how, how do you stop a a bully in the flock so to speak well sydney tends to be a bully as well uh he can fly now but we're not going to tell him that he can because he hasn't tried in a while he had to be grounded for a little bit because he is uh he's an extreme bully he he goes he, he goes after my other male so we had to kind of ground them for a little bit um, to prevent everyone's safety, including my own, trying to get in between the two. So it depends on where the cages are in the house, how you have them set up. Like behind me, you guys didn't see as I'm setting up, but every time I set them up and I have them out, I have to figure out who can go where that, first off, they're not going to fly and land on my head, which happens or try landing on a computer, which happened today. Um, so I got to make, I, I have to be aware of where everybody is to keep them separated enough so it's not, you know, they're able to get to each other. And also you want to make sure that, that Timna has a lot of things to do that are positive, like maybe his favorite toy or maybe a treat or something on his play gym you know, a, a tree or or something similar is going to be a lot more exciting and fun to do than, say, just a metal tea stand. A metal tea stand, you might not have anything else to do, but it's fun to chase the grays. 
So if you have something that's more fun to preoccupy them with something better and keep them a little bit more separated, that might help. Okay, and then um, someone uh, had a question. My gray is OCD with dirt. <laughs> she has gotten into herb plants twice, but wants to roll and dig in dirt and tear up the plants. The vet uh, said not allowed. Uh, is organic dirt safe? Uh, is that an option? Um, and do grays need this activity? Like, do they roll in the dirt in the wild? Do they do they get all well, yeah, they, up in the dirt they in the wild? They do do that in the wild. But you'll see them on the riverbed scratching and you know getting a little bit dirty. I don't necessarily let any kind of soil near my guys because the soil can contain mold. Mold can cause aspergillosis or the mold spores can contribute to aspergillosis. That's probably more correct. Um, and I've had to deal with that disease twice. Um, it's very expensive and it's not fun. And I don't have either one of those birds um, because they both passed on. So I would suggest to listen to the vet, move the the plants into a different area. Um, I have mine in my dining room and the birds never go in the dining room um, unless Sterling decides to take flight and doesn't know where to land. So, you know, I try to keep everything separate. It's just safer. And I see somebody said Pseudomonas lives in dirt. Mm -hmm. um, where I am in the country, we don't really have to deal with that. I understand more Southern states. I know Florida has, has to deal with a lot of Pseudomonas. So, and that's very hard to treat because it's always in the environment. So just wow. be careful. Okay. Oh, I wonder if there's an alternative to a dirt feel for a parrot. <laughs> well, another, another thing I'm always worried about with something that they can scratch in or get into, or even like chewing a drywall or anything like that is there's going to be dust in the environment. Okay. And what are they doing? They're breathing it in. It's right there. So again, that can cause a lot of different issues. So, you know, if you want them to rip up something, for instance, my guys all like to scratch and they're in their nighttime cages. So I usually use U-Haul paper or packing paper, but everybody knows it as U-Haul paper. Um, I will use that so they can dig and scratch around in that, or mm -hmm. I'll use a paper towel and I put that in there to let them have at it. So if you want to put a piece of paper down on the ground or on your coffee table and want to let them scratch, go for it. All right. Um, and then we have a question. Uh, someone's a uh, Congo African gray sometimes squats low and sort of flaps her wings, not fully extended and she sways back and forth. She's usually sitting uh, with her with them. Um, can't tell what the behavior might be. So what would a bird squat and kind of semi flap their wings mean? Okay, so that's probably a quick one like this quick flap. Um, if she's squatting down, um, it could be she's starting to masturbate. Um, so you got to watch that. That's the first thing that came to my mind because they'll lower down, they'll lift their wings up a little bit. They might quick flap it, um, but it's not in full extent. It's just close to the body. Um, or it could be that she's sitting with a favored person. And there could be something else going on in the room, whether somebody walks by or there's something on TV or somebody moves something and she's catching that and seeing it and going into protect mode. Oh, wow. Okay. Those are two different uh, mindsets for the bird. To so kind so of you watch the, the environment. Yeah. Watch the environment and see what's going on. Okay. That's a, that's a okay. So we have a 40 year old a wild caught gym that uh, they've had since he was nine months old. And every year since he's matured, when breeding, breeding season hits, uh, he lets out, but he lets one of his toenails grow extra long. Uh, only one. He's got one long toenail. Um, and it's like the same toad. Uh, have you noticed that before? Is that something you've heard of? They, they call it his fighting claw, which is kind of funny. Uh, when breeding season uh, ends, he, he chops. He chops it off. So he, he likes okay. like, Hey ladies, I, I got this. Right. I have not personally seen that. I have not heard that, but maybe that's his little special power to pull the ladies in. <laughs> maybe that's what he thinks he needs to do. Um, you know, cause a lot of birds will display in the wild. So maybe, maybe that's just, maybe he thinks it's pretty. And when he's doesn't have his mate, that's when he chops it off. Yeah, I want to see a picture of that. <laughs> Extra line now. Okay. Um, uh, okay, here we go. Um, is there any correlation to who the gray is more receptive to, male or female, uh, or female to male human? So um, 
No. No. No preference. No, that's that's going to be an old wives' tale. Um, I have not found that. Um, I've had nine, ten, ten different grays come through. Um, seven have been mine. The other ones have either stayed here very short term or came through. Um, but really, what happens is again, we're going back to the eighteen and twenty four time frame. Um, in the wild, that's when the birds were like picking their friends and, you know, shooing the parents away because parents aren't cool anymore because now they're teenagers. So, you know, that's kind of how we all did it. And what happens is, um, you know, he's going to be a little testy. And here you have, for instance, you have the male go in and he gets a, get offers his hand, the bird bites and the man pulls away his hand. Now he's aggravating because his baby just bit him. Now he wants nothing to do with him. So that bird has learned biting makes people go away. Now the female comes in, he bites the female too. But the female's like, oh, no, no, no. Come on, baby, let's go. You know, and the, and the bird realizes that biting the female doesn't make her go away. Okay. So now he's going to be more apt to go after the male if the male even bothers with him again where he knows, well, it doesn't make sense to try it with this one because she's still going to come. So that's how the one person favored thing goes. Um, my husband can pretty much handle any of my birds, male and female. The one male who's 40 years old that is also a wild caught import um, that I that was my dad's and I grew up with. Um, he does not like my husband. So that's why we have the little perch for him to get up because there are some times that Sterling's going to need to get up whether he wants to or not. And my husband needs to be able to move him safely so everybody can, you know, come out in the morning and get fed and then, you know, be on the play gym. I can't expect my husband to leave the bird in his little cage all day long if, if I'm not home. That can't happen. So workarounds okay um then a question about uh, my gray only um talk and chats when uh when they're not in the room <laughs> and i love them to make noise when they're in the room um uh they'll make the noise they'll they'll, they'll vocalize when they're when their daughter is in the um and they're all the time and they're confused kind of reminds me of that old uh, cartoon with the frog that i don't know yeah the frog old. dancing frog dancing yep. frog and then like they try and then he stops <laughs> yep exactly bugs bunny right yeah. um that i mean how how old is the bird if the bird is just learning how to chat a lot of times the babies will not talk around you they'll practice and then all of a sudden one day they'll just say something and it scares you because you didn't expect it to come out um that happened a lot with my first timna when i moved in with my husband he had no idea these birds could talk so i happened to go down to florida and this bird was talking in my voice. So he kept coming upstairs to check and see if I snuck back in the house. <laughs> then he finally caught the bird talking and realized I wasn't there. Mm. So, I mean, if it's a baby, that could be why, um, you know, you want to try to engage it. And, you know, if you're out in the other room, you know, try to talk a lot with it and, you know, see if that helps. Okay, I think that's, uh, we're, let's see, I think we're at our time with our questions. Uh, if we didn't get to your question today, um, we'll, we'll email you a response. And um, I'm going to announce our winner of our of our uh, giveaway. We have our giveaway. And also just, yeah, we're celebrating this right here. 50, 50 years of Bluff Eber. Um, so uh, we're going we're gonna to give away the original product that started the company, and that's their, um, their, their pellets, their uh, their pelleted diet, which is a mainstay. Um, and that is going to go out to Lynette Swanson. Congratulations. You win um, the pet little fever uh, daily diet and also another uh, little fever product of your bird's choice. And uh, Lisa, once again, uh, bravo on the, on the, uh, the presentation. I mean, your, I'm, I'm, your, your, your skills on your PowerPoints are getting even like, every time they get better and better. Not that they started bad at all, but <laughs> I like the little guy at the end. He's kind of like doing the little bow, your little gray at the end there. That was a good touch. Well, it's it's an updated version of PowerPoint I'm using this time around. So maybe it, it likes me a little bit better. There we go. There we go. That was uh, once again, hey, it's great to see you and see you again this year. And I'm, I look forward to 
the other topics we'll be covering with you. So um, again, thanks for your time, Lisa. Great presentation. Hopefully that helps, uh, uh, it, you know, give some definite, some background to the behaviors you see in your, your birds at home. So thank you. Um, all right. And then next week, guys, um, Friday, we'll be back with uh, Dr. Tom Tolley. So he'll be answering uh, any any uh, questions you have uh, with the Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley next Friday. So, all right. On that end, everyone, thanks again for joining us, Lisa. Wonderful. Um, Thank you. Till next time, guys, everyone stay, uh, stay safe. Have a great weekend. Until next time, all the best. Bye.